So what I will present today is a long-term goal that I had. And I recently moved to London to achieve this goal because I think it's the right time to do it. I will try to convince you that this is true. <coughs> we all have ideas, dreams, wishes. Creativity is one of the most exciting things of human beings. We are more happy when we create. It's a way for people to realize themselves. Didn't you hear sometimes some friends saying, oh, it would be great to have a website that does that, that, and that? Or it would be great that my TV speaks to my phone so that I could do this? We often appreciate innovative things, as we appreciate all the talks of the previous talks, because it has also a great business application. Today, in our post-industrial society, innovation, creativity, is one of the core components of economical growth. There is an issue, though. Everyone can have great ideas, but very few are actually achieved. Let's take a few examples. Here is Virginia. She's a university student. She is thinking about a new software to help her to make her revision plan, based on how people like her succeeded in the previous years. For some reason, she has the data, but she doesn't have time. She doesn't know how to program. So this potentially great idea will just disappear. Here is another example. Leonard, in his family, he stays home, looks at holiday pictures. His son, Lytton, then has a great idea. He says, what if the TV photo viewer could send automatically pictures to grandma when we all say, wow, together? The whole family agrees this is a great idea. But they also agree that they are not programmers. Then we have John. It's a taxi, he's a taxi driver and has a very fancy way of using his GPS. For some reason, unknown to us, when the taxi number 45 is somewhere, he wants to avoid crossing its road. OK, why not? So now 10 times a week, he's modifying manually his GPS routing module so that he will not cross taxi number 45. The issue is that his GPS will never have the feature avoid taxi number 45. Finally, we have Vanessa, a Bloomberg data analyst. She also wants to automate repetitive tasks that uh, she has, uh, is doing every day, such as searching, reading, comp copy, paste, in Excel, modify, edit. But everybody knows how difficult it is to make software to be compatible to each other. So she finally accepts that the fact that repetitive tasks is just part of her job. You noticed probably that for all of these examples, a digital device was at the core of the problem. They wanted to modify the way digital devices were behaving. There is a clear loss of creativity, and here is a culprit. Programming languages. They are complex. They are subject to bugs. They can make errors if they are used in an unexpected way. And when we want to update them, then we need to call the software editor who find who program what, and then put a modification request in the list of already features to add to the next release, which will come up a year if you're lucky. Last but not least, creators are not the programmers. There is a huge loss in efficiency in the mismatch between the two. <coughs> Let me go back to the history of computing language. So initially, we had the first computer that was programmed using, by manipulating switching on cable. But very quickly, people realized that it's better to invent programming language to speak to the computer, basically. So after maybe assembly language or early language, quickly people, Kerningham and Ritchie invented the C language 
which was a big revolution because now most of the softwares you are using to say to, today are derivation of the C language. And the C language evolved recently a lot into C++, but more importantly, scripting languages. So if you're a data scientist today, you know that you will be using Python, R, PHP, Scala, a lot of high-level programming language, which are much easier to understand. But still, they're not really natural. I'm predicting that the next programming language will not be a programming language. It will be natural language. Your language. Any language, it could be French, English, German, Dutch, as you want. The key enabler for that is machine learning, as you have understood from the previous talk. Why does it matter? It matters because initially, the first computer could be programmed by two people, the creator of the computer. Thanks to the invention of programming language, now we have around 10 millions of programmers in the world. But still, it's just 0.1% of the world population. So it means that if we have natural language programming in hand, we can potentially have 1,000 times more programmers in the world. <coughs> Do you really want to continue reading such things? <laughs> Let's go to an example. I want to do a random task. For example, here, I want to list all my coworkers with their picture and a domain of expertise. Okay, it's a quite, quite a classical task of information extraction. I have unstructured emails, and I want to create a table, structured representation of uh, the output of my program. How would, how would I do that using natural language programming? The third thing to understand is that I will not use the way we usually program. I will use something similar to what was presenting just before. I will use dialogue. I will use interaction with the programmer on the computer. So we'll teach computers to execute actions. Let's look at this example. The human, the teacher, will say, please, please computer. You don't have to, to say please to a computer, but you can. So please list the people I worked with recently. So the computer already knows basically the, the, the representation of the world. So he has applied word to, word to vec, for example. But the concept of worked with recently is not well understood. He doesn't have enough data about that. So he's giving an answer, but then it's not really correct. Someone is missing. Oh, no, is missing. The human say to the computer, oh, no, is missing. Then the computer asks, why? Why should I include him? And here is one crucial component, is that the human will explain to the computer. He will say, because we submitted a project proposal together. When you say that, you somehow give the indication to the computer that project proposal <laughs> and the work we've recently are linked together. So the next time you will ask a question, you hope program has updated its parameter to give you the right solution. But not only that, but it can take immediately into account this modification. It can even realize that Max was missing. OK, should I include Max as well? Because it seems that in my email, Max was also working on a project proposal. And what's really important is to say yes to the computer, because he knows he has done something good. It's very important, like kids, to tell them that they have done something correct. Okay, so now we can ask the same question, and hopefully the computer learns. So now it doesn't make a mistake. We can go to the next step. So it's important also to say good. <laughs> Not so, too often, but sometimes. So for each of them, give me their domain of expertise. Then the computer just answers, okay, Julien, reinforcement learning, Beza, machine learning, and so on. But then you want to debug a little bit. You say, why oh no, he has an expertise as mechanism design? Why mechanism design is the expertise of Ono? And this is one of the crucial research that we are also doing. It is giving explanations. So today, it's quite hard for a computer to give explanation about its decision. So here, 
what we are working on is to give this type of explanation because most of his publications are in this category. So now we have a sort of debugging section. If you already program Java, you don't have 10 pages of debugging instruction. You just have a clear natural language explanation about the results of the program. This is the way you debug. So to summarize, programming in natural language is done by chatting, giving to the computer facts, explanation about the world, and verification questions. It always runs. The creator are the trainer of the system. They give it facts, for example, for this input, output that, please. And you can give rules. All things with, with this attribute are like that. Or all mans are human. Um, and finally, programming become dynamic. This is one of the crucial points of programming in natural language. What are the techniques that we are working on at UCL today to enable such applications in the near future, hopefully? So our research direction is the following. We want to enable computers to understand human language so humans do not have to understand computer languages. If we just take the first part of this sentence, enabling computers to understand human language, this is precisely the definition of a scientific domain which is called natural language processing. I don't like acronyms, but some people already used it earlier. It's called NLP. Let's look at the examples of problems that are tackled in this domain, natural language processing. So we have a house robot, and we just ask him a very simple thing. Please give me a glass of water. So you have six words, but in these six words, you have at least three very important problems that we need to tackle. The first one is how to ground words to reality. How is it possible for the computer to understand that a glass of water is not made of water? It has to understand that it has to be filled with water. It's really not obvious for a computer. The next thing is that it has to know how much water it should pull in. It shouldn't fill it too much. It shouldn't be too, too low. This is the use of prior knowledge. We know that the guy is asking that because he wants to drink, probably. So we probably need to fill the, 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 the glass well. And then we need to plan actions. I will not speak about this today, but you have probably heard about the acquisition of DeepMind two years ago by Google. This was one of the main uh, success stories where they implemented a reinforcement learning algorithm to uh, solve this problem efficiently. So there were some recent breakthroughs in natural language processing. The first one is grounding, linking text to knowledge. The second one is understanding explanation. You remember in the dialogue when I gave explanations <coughs> to the computer? The computer has to understand explanation. But it also has to give explanation in order to debug. So let's look at grounding. This means we have text and a relational database. We want to merge them together and get some prediction results. For example, here, we have a Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article about Hercules, and we have a knowledge base about the relation between gods in the Roman mythology. This is <coughs> an example of structured data and unstructured data. We would like to do some prediction. For example, we would like to suggest edits in Wikipedia because we have some knowledge here that is not written in Wikipedia, but we also would like to structure the data, such as we improving um, uh, the, the prediction performance or uh, adding data in this graph. For example, here, we want to know what the relation between Hercules and Jupiter. If you look at the text, actually, it's written. It's written that, actually, Hercules, which is here, so you need to identify it, and Jupiter are mentioned in the same sentence. Note that it's not trivial because Jupiter could also be a planet. But here, machine learning helps you to disambiguate, to take into account the context, and to identify that Jupiter is actually the god. And next, uh, and next, you can identify that in the sentence there is sun. So probably you will be able to guess the parental relationships between Hercules and Jupiter. So 
the way we can do that, the early, pro the early algorithm, and still a lot of people are working today, is based on combinatorial optimization. It means I'll try it somehow to use the graph properties to find the minimal, um, the, closest, the shortest path between nodes to try to guess what are the missing relation, if I want to detect this relation. Actually, this type of combinatorial algorithm do not scale in general. We need to find another paradigm. And this is somehow the paradigm that is used by deep learning. It's called the embedding model. The first step that you need to do is to transform any graph into some sort of better representation, which is a matrix. A matrix is one of the core tools for people working in linear algebra. For those who don't know what is linear algebra, linear algebra is just representing objects as vectors and assuming that combination of these vectors are made by just weighted sum. It's very simple. In this example, I represent my knowledge graph as with this green dot here in the matrix, it represents ones in the matrix. And the remaining ones are roughly zero, meaning that they are probably false, but not always. And our goal will be to take into account this green dot, for example, the green dot here, Hercules, Jupiter, is sun off, has been extracting from the text. So we can put it in the right place in the matrix here. We can also do the same with the knowledge. For example, brother on Hercules Pluton is true. Uh, Hercules and uh, Neptune are, sorry, it's not here, yeah, are brothers. We know that. So we can now predict, ask the model to give us the prediction in the missing hole in the matrix. And this can be achieved with a very simple algorithm, actually one of the oldest algorithms in linear algebra. It's called matrix factorization. The idea behind matrix factorization, also called singular value decomposition or principal component analysis, they are all the same, it's to transform a matrix into a decomposition, a product of two matrices. So that when you want to do a prediction, for example, my blue cell here will simply be the dot product, so this weighted sum of latent parameters here, a vector, and the vector here. And this operation is super efficient, can be done very quickly by special units such as uh, GPUs, general purpose uh, computation units. So now that we have a very efficient algorithm, and a lot of people are using that, uh, even in Google and Facebook, um, now that we have this efficient algorithm, what do we want to do? We would like to have as many data as possible. So, but the issue is that this data is not always there, especially in your targeted application. If the taxi application, in all these people that wanted to program things around them, the data is not there. They need, you need to acquire. You need to talk to the computer so that it has the required data. So classically, and this is what we have seen in the previous talk, you learn from facts. For example, x is z, x means z. So this is initiated by the user, which explains things. Uh, I mean, it gives fact, factual knowledge to the computer. Another way is to the computer to ask. So you have seen it also. It's called active learning. But what we are doing, which is quite new and unique, is to work on explanation, because it's much more powerful. If you say every man is mortal, it's worth billions of units of uh, fact, factual knowledge. So for example, the computer can understand every y x is, implies y. If x is y, then z. It could also be initiated by the computer, uh, asking questions, y questions, these famous y questions that you have seen in uh, the first example of dialogue. So how do we do that? Understanding explanation. This is the second research topic in which we have been quite successful and there is uh, currently um, a paper pre pre uh, presented this week in one of the main natural language pro uh, conference related to that. So we have the same example of knowledge, and we want to guess this link. We want, it's a missing link, it doesn't exist. We want to know the parental relationships between the family relationships between Hercules and Neptune. What is the relationship between them? So if you look at the graph, you understand that there is a brother, there is a father. And so we all know that it is the uncle. But the computer doesn't know what is an uncle. Maybe he has never seen an uncle before. So we give him, we give it, 
to the computer some explanation. For example, we give him the, some clue. An uncle is a brother of a parent, and the father is a parent. By using these two pieces of information, now we can guess this missing link that was not part of the data. So we have explanation on the left, and we have data on the right. We want to improve prediction. Why is it important to take the two into account? It's because if you use no data for this, uh, uh, data only, so this is somehow the big missing data problem. If we use data only, you will get 0% prediction on relation you have never seen before. So if you have not seen on call, you predict zero. And in the experiment we have done, by removing artificially some relation from the data set, by using only the explanation, we can already improve. It's a sort of expert system that is just using the rules. We get 23%. But what's more interesting is that by merging it with data, we also reach the 52%, meaning a, a more than two times improvement in the prediction accuracy. Why does it work? Why data is used? It's because the data help us to predict things around on call. For example, the parental relationship is not always explicit in text. So by detecting parental relationships in text, by predicting that some, PC, some pairs of entity are probably in relationship together, we can predict them efficiently. And finally, I would like to uh, mention, one minute, okay. So I will not explain you this big revolution in deep learning, which is generating text from uh, any uh, given object. I would like to give you final words. So to summarize what I have said today, we want people to create or to modify digital devices. Giving, give them the right tools, and you will have literally a nursery of innovation, and therefore economical growth. Today, most of the innovation comes through digital devices. We must be able to program them to take full ad advantage of our creativity. Programming by teaching is one potential great solution to this problem. It will cut completely the software development cost, and everyone will be able to implement their ID. So somehow, this, is, this will create new jobs. Now software engineers will become trainers. It might even be fun. It's much more fun to interact than simply give a static piece of code. 2,000 years ago, there was an invention. It was paper. Paper was used, was invented to solve one problem. But actually, papers helped to solve many of our problems. Printing newspapers, cleaning things, making origamis, even building house. Could you imagine the inventor of paper to know what will be the applications? With programming by teaching, it's somehow the same. We are creating a medium of creation. Paper was a medium of creation. You could invent many things with the paper. But also with programming by teaching, you can also invent many things. We don't know how people will use our uh, somehow virtual agent. Will Vanessa, uh, Virginia, sorry, <laughs> be able to create her, her virtual friend that will help her during her exam? Will uh, Leonard be able to create a virtual Tamagoshi on his TV? Will the taxi driver will be happy with this modified GPS? And will uh, the data analyst automate a lot of repetitive tasks by herself? It's time, I think, to stop considering the computer as a tool. We should consider computer as a partner. So much, Guillaume. I hope uh, this talk has inspired a couple of questions from the audience, as I think it's generally applicable to basically everyone in this room. Yeah. Got one at the back there? Yeah. No, yeah. no wait, hang on. Just that um, one first, and I'll give you. Uh, me first or him first? That one first, okay. then. Uh, yeah, so you're talking about using uh, natural language for programming, and one of your examples was. Uh, for the woman who had a problem was automating, and I just had to do some automating just with a web service. And for that, you have to download an external library, 
And I was wondering, does your, like, how would the rollout for kind of natural programming languages work? Yeah, because yeah, obviously yeah. you're not going to have a library for I did not have time be. to put it, but here is how uh, Apple would write instruction to set up your email. Okay, this is the natural language instructions that you can download on the internet. It's made for humans. Here is my natural language program that I would do to solve this coworker detection problem. Here, you directly see a, a high level description about the program in natural language. It's important, it's a title. Then you have a list of what you need. There are the inputs. So the library you want to download. Maybe you want, do want to download the dictionary of expertise. Or and you also want to download the pictures of people. You just m mention it, what, you, what the program needs. Yes. And, uh, just last question. OK, um, I relate a lot to what you said um, about increasing the breadth of the people who can program, specifically in related to giving instructions about something. Um, difficulty aside, do you think it's actually better for people to try to program things that are more dynamic, like things that have nested or recursive logic? These things are. Re, like people when they code, they don't even have a clear understanding of the steps involved. And these things are also pretty common in programming. Like these things are, so for example, a... So I don't really understand your, your question. What so your so, so pretty, uh, what's occurring a lot in programming aside from for the purpose of software engineering is nested logic like loops inside loops or recursive logic where the behavior of the algorithm is dynamic. So we are not doing logic. We are learning how to reason. We are just taking input and output. It's really a machine learning problem. We are not using logic. My, my question is not about the solution. It's about the usefulness of the solution. Do you think um, people want to prog are able even to replace writing code with language to do these kinds oh, of things? Okay. Yeah. The question is, will it re replace all the software engineers? I it, don't think so. Yeah. Like Morse code today, it still used by militaries. Yeah. So programming language will still exist, but they will just their importance will probably decrease. All right, thanks so much, Kim. Um, join me in thanking all the six speakers for this morning.